with that, let's get into our study. You know, we're almost done with Second Chronicles. And once we are, we go right into the book of Ezra. Really looking forward to that. But tonight, Second Chronicles chapter 33. And uh, why don't we pray and we'll ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. If you would join with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for this time that we have on Thursday nights to just come to this beautiful church building that you've given us and put aside all the cares and the affairs and the busyness of our busy lives, and they are busy. We just pray that we'll be able to, tonight, by the Holy Spirit, give you our undivided attention so that you can speak into our lives in and through your word and minister to us. Lord, we're looking forward to what you have for us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But, verse 2, and here it is, here we go. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So we're off to a horrible start. <laughs> uh, what a way to start a Bible study, right? Chapter begins by reintroducing us to Manasseh. Uh, for those of you who are with us in our study through the book of 2 Kings, you uh, remember first meeting him there. Uh, he is... Uh, the longest reigning king in the history of Israel. And sadly, it could also be said that his uh, reign was as evil as it was long. But, interestingly, as we're going to see towards the end of the chapter, he does re repent in a most dramatic way. And, uh, but, Unfortunately, it's not before committing unspeakable and abominable sins. Something I want to point out before we uh, get into our study here, and it has to do with Manasseh's age when he became king. This is one of those places in God's Word where the detail is important, and we have such a detail here where we're told that he was 12 years old when he became king. Now, why is that an important detail? Because it means that he would have been born three years into the 15 years that God gave his father Hezekiah in extending his life. Now, I point that out because, uh, and remember now, Hezekiah, a good king who failed at the end of his life, sinned greatly against the Lord, and then he repented, and God, in his grace, granted him an additional 15 years uh, of life. However, three years into that 15 years, he has this son, Manasseh, who would be an evil king. So again, we've got a case of a bad son that comes from a good father at the end of his life. Now, one has suggested and this is interesting to me, that were Hezekiah to know that he was going to have such a wicked son who would succeed him as king and do evil in the sight of the Lord, that uh, it's unlikely that he w would have wanted to live an additional 15 years. And I, I, I get that, and I understand the reasoning behind that, but this is a but God thing. <laughs> But I do believe that God, in his sovereignty, knew, who, the God who knows the end from the beginning, that he was going to bring good out of the evil in spite of the evil. And it comes by way of his repentance at the end of the life, at, at, at the end of his life, which as we're going to see is one of the most powerful testimonies of God's grace and mercy. I, I think that uh, it would be likened to the dramatic conversion of one Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament. 
I mean, you have to understand that Saul of Tarsus thought that he was actually helping God out by killing these Christians <laughs> that uh, were coming to Christ, the early church. And he was instrumental in uh, and a part of, played a role in the killing of those first Christians. And God saves him and he repents. And so too do we have a similar case here with uh, Hezekiah's repentance, or uh, Manasseh's repentance. And I don't want to get ahead of our Selves here. So verse 3, for he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. How sad is this? Remember the restoration project of his father Hezekiah? He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshiped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars, verse 4, in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Wow. <laughs> so here Manasseh reinstitutes re this idolatrous, idolatrous worship, the very idolatrous worship that his father Hezekiah had removed from the temple. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit would have the chronicler record the detail in verse 4 concerning the name of God being in Jerusalem. I mention that because from prior studies and even from prior prophecy updates, We've seen how that this is literally true, that in it, it's by way of the sheen, which is the abbreviation, many believe, for the name of God, El Shaddai. And if you take the sheen, the Hebrew sheen, which is really, uh, it looks like an a English W, it is actually literally placed as God's name on the city of Jerusalem. God literally put his name there. We're going to see this again here uh, as well. Verse 6, also he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. This is that practice of uh, taking and burning alive the infants. He was, at, and, and it's not just any sons or daughters. The, these were his own sons that would be sacrificed to the god Malach there in the valley of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, here it is again, which I have chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if, this is conditional, they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So, and this is interesting, verse 9, Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Wow. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. This uh, word seduced is there for a reason. And uh, one of the reasons is because he reinstituted the most abominable worship of and, and sexual practices. You'll forgive me, but basically this worship was uh, that of sexual orgies in the temple. In the temple. Now, this is one of those places in God's word where you read the words 
on the pages of your Bible, and it doesn't sink in that this actually really happened. And just to put it into perspective, think of it this way. It would be akin to practicing witchcraft and setting up sexual images, even pornographic images, here in this beautiful church that God has given us. That's what they were doing in the temple. So he seduced them to do this in the place where God had placed his name. Second Kings chapter 21 gives us more detail. It says, he even set a carved image of Asherah. Now Asherah was the goddess of sex. Uh, some of the ancient archaeological finds of these Asherah goddesses are, again, you'll forgive the graphic nature of it, but they're multi-breasted images. And the way that they would worship this Asherah is they would have these sexual, you know, orgies around this worship of Asherah. By the way, uh, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday, which I don't call it Easter. Uh, I used to, but I don't anymore, and here's why. And it's just a thing with me. It's not a, you know, a legalism thing, but Easter comes from Astarte, and Astarte is another name for Asherah. Astarte was the goddess of sex and fertility. You know that's how the Easter bunny came about? The hare, the rabbit, in uh, Greek uh, culture was seen as the uh, symbol of fertility and lust, which is why, by the way, uh, the Playboy franchise uses the bunny as their uh, you know, logo. It's, it's known as, uh, you know, the uh, symbol of lust and, and fertility. And this is why um, this, uh, this is why it's actually called Easter. That's where the uh, word Easter came from, Astarte or Ashtarah. And uh, in, in other, well, I'm going to, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself again. But it says that he even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. The name is the nature. This is the character and the nature of a holy God. And in that place where his name is, where his name was placed, this most grievous and horrific of practices was taking place. Adam Clark said this, from the whole, it is evident that Asherah was no other than Venus, the nature of whose worship is plain enough from the mention of whoremongers and prostitutes. It is a study of this many years back, but um, the, the, uh, these mythological gods and goddesses like uh, Cupid, uh, Horus, and Iris, these are all the same sex gods and goddesses, and they just have different names, and this was one such name of this uh, goddess. Verse 10, and keep in mind, Manasseh was setting up this abominable practice and worship in the temple. Here his father had just cleared out. Remember, it took him 16 days. <laughs> That's a lot of trips to the dump <laughs> to get rid of all of these things. And what does he do? He comes in and puts it all back and sets it all up. Now, verse 10. And this is where it gets interesting. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but... And these four words should send chills up and down every single one of our spines. They would not listen. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks. By the way, I know this is graphic. We, we, we should probably put an R rating on tonight's Bible study, but they would take... And 
they would impale through the nose this, this hook and drag them along uh, with these uh, chains. And this is what they're doing now to this king. So they put the hooks in him, they bound him with bronze fetters, and they carried him off to Babylon. This is one of those uh, places in God's word where you kind of have to do a double take of sorts and you know, try to wrap your mind around what has just happened here. And it's happened because Manasseh and the people would not listen when the Lord spoke to them, warning them concerning their grievous evil. Again, in 2 Kings 21, verse 9, we're provided with more detail. It says that not only did they not listen, and this is an important detail, they actually paid no attention. They stopped their ears to the warning, to the voice of the Lord. In other words, they heard, but they wouldn't heed. They, they wouldn't listen. They deliberately made the decision to pay no attention to the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> I think you would agree that this would be an apt description of those who want nothing to do with the Lord, but this is actually describing the people of the Lord, and this should never be named amongst the Lord's people. It's interesting that replete throughout the Old Testament, we read passages like, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, hear the word of the Lord. But they would not listen. They would not pay attention. They deliberately refused to hear, let alone take heed to this warning from the Lord, this word of the Lord. Something else is interesting here, and it's not so easily seen when you first read the passage, but in the narrative, there's no mention of anyone taking a stand for righteousness in the face of Manasseh's unspeakable evil. And that would seem to indicate that the Israelites were, because they were seduced, they were willing participants in this unspeakable evil and practice that was imposed upon them by Manasseh. And to me, this explains why God would mete out such a harsh judgment, especially upon Manasseh, because he's the one who reinstituted it. He's the one that seduced them to do it. And lest one think that God's judgment by allowing the Assyrians to come and do this to Manasseh, and isn't it interesting too, we're not told that they dragged off anyone else. You would think that the narrative would include, you know, the people as well. Manasseh and all the people. But no, it is singular. <laughs> one, one man is taken away and carried away with this hook in his nose and bronze fetters to Babylon and it's Manasseh. Now, this is not disproportionate, and this for two reasons. First, God in his grace and mercy tried first to warn them, to warn him by speaking to them, but they wouldn't pay any attention to him. Second, the unspeakable evil that God tried to warn them about was absolutely deserving of swift and severe judgment. And this is why God has allowed it. Again, I'm going to refer to uh, 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 16, which gives us uh, some interesting detail. It says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. And I don't think this is an exaggeration in the sense of 
what we're given here in the description. It says, till he had filled Jerusalem with blood from one end to another, besides his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, there's a twofold dynamic here. Not only was his sin so evil, but he got Israel to also sin in such an evil way. It's actually for this reason that Jewish tradition suggests it was actually Manasseh who sawed the prophet Isaiah in half in Jerusalem. And which would explain why the blood would flow in the streets from one end to the other. Charles Spurgeon had this to say about it. He said, we cannot vouch for the tradition that the prophet Isaiah was put to death by, being, by him being sawn in sunder, but terrible as is the legend, it's not at all improbable. And I would have to concur. This is how evil this man was. This is, and remember, the prophet Isaiah, this was a contemporary of his father, of Manasseh's father, Hezekiah. Hezekiah would consult with the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Isaiah would pronounce and prophesy the word of the Lord in response to, to his father seeking the Lord. And this is how his son repays the prophet Isaiah. Well, it makes sense. Someone like Manasseh, as evil as he was, he doesn't want to hear the prophet Isaiah speak. In fact, I, I'm going to kind of venture off here and, and make a suggestion that uh, the warning from the Lord to Manasseh may have very well come by way of Isaiah. And this was the response. He has him sawed in half there in Jerusalem. Now, verse 12, when he was in affliction, <laughs> he implored the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, in his affliction, he calls out after all that he did. I mean, if, if, if I'm God, which is why I'm not, <laughs> and somebody did this much evil in the place where my name was, where he reinstitutes this kind of horrific, idolatrous worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and he fills the streets from one end to the other with the blood of the likes of the prophet Isaiah, and then he calls out to me, I'm going to say, no way, dude. <laughs> to, don't look at me like that. You're, <laughs> you'd probably do the same thing. Are you kidding me? No. But here's the thing. He humbled himself greatly. Ah, I believe that when we humble ourselves, God finds us irresistible. God cannot resist when one of his own humbles themselves before him, and he prays to him, and God received his entreaty, God heard his supplication, and God brings him back to Jerusalem, into his kingdom, restores him in his reign as king. Again, this is perhaps amongst the greatest examples of repentance in all of Scripture. I mean, again, the Apostle Paul would be a, a, a similar uh, example, but when you consider just how evil the reign of Manasseh was, and it really uh, speaks to a question that uh, I think we would do well to answer, and it has to do with how God brings a man to repentance. Whether it's by his kindness or by his justice. And by that I mean that oftentimes 
God in his grace and mercy will show us kindness with the hopes that we'll repent the easy way. You know, you, you've heard it said that you, there's the easy way and then there's the hard way. I don't know what it is about me, but it's always the hard way <laughs> for me, and I have the scars to prove it. Uh, this, this speaks to the nature of God, and, and the Apostle Peter in his second epistle says in chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all of us to repent. Romans 2.4 has become, for me, uh, a very important verse slash promise. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing, listen, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Oh, I, I wish that it was only the goodness of God, not the, the justice of God, but I wish it was only the goodness of God that would be enough to lead me to repentance. I personally believe that God in his long-suffering and forbearance will do everything possible to get our attention first before he has to mete out judgment, before he has to basically deliver us into the hands of the Assyrians, so to speak. God takes no delight in doing that, but hey, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. God will always try to warn us first. God doesn't in any way desire to deliver us into the hands of the Assyrians, but if that's what it takes to get us to repent, which is the case with Manasseh, then he will do it. And the reason is, is that he loves us too much and he won't give up on us. And he's the God of second chances. And this is what we see here with Manasseh. Again, Spurgeon says it best this way, oh, I do not wonder at Manasseh's sin one half so much as I wonder at God's mercy. It, we saw this in our study of the life of David. It wasn't recorded for us in Scripture to show us how bad David was, and he was bad. <laughs> he, he committed murder and adultery, which were two things at that time that were punishable by death, but God. But God forgave him, God restored him, he repented. He repented and God restored him. And it's not recorded for us, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, graphic. And, and, and really, I don't wanna know how David plotted to have Uriah murdered. And it's really painful when you read the account of what David, I mean, this is David that slew Goliath. This is David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This is, <laughs> this is David, the greatest king from whom the savior of the world would come. And then he does that. Now why does God record such detail about what David did? It's not to show us how bad he was, it's to show us how good God is in spite of how bad he was and how evil he was. And such is the case here with Manasseh. G. Camel Morgan said it this way, Manasseh's repentance was evidently the chief subject in the mind of the chronicler. And while his sins are painted faithfully and revealed in all of their hideousness, all becomes but background, which flings into relief Manasseh's genuine penitence and the ready, and I love this, the ready and gracious response to God. I picture God waiting on standby. I picture God like the father in the parable that Jesus taught about the son, the prodigal son, who's waiting, 
waiting for his son to repent and return. And when he sees him from afar off, he's come to his senses. In a way, he's been dragged off by the Assyrians, you might say. He mean, he's, and you have to understand, for a Jewish boy to be shoveling the uh, waste of a pig as unclean as the pig is. And that's how low he had become. But that's what it took. And he comes to his senses. And he returns. He repents and he returns. And in the parable, the father, who's not only waiting and watching for him, runs to him. Now why is that important in, in, in knowing? Because in that culture, the father never runs to the son. It's unthinkable for the father to run to the son. Now, the point is, is that that's what our heavenly father is like. It, it would be considered shameful for the father to run to the son. Even in my, my culture as an Arab growing up, boy, I tell you, the son always respected the father. When the father walked into the room, the son would get up. People would rise up and stand to honor the father, the father would come, he would always take the best seat. And, and then when he sat down, then the uh, children would, would sit down. That was the honor and the respect that the son had for the father. And the, the picture of the father running to his son, that's the heart of our heavenly father who, as Morgan says, is ready and gracious to respond. He's at the ready, waiting on standby, if you will, for us to repent and to return. And he runs to us. Verse 14. After this, this is so dramatic. <laughs> he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed a fell, and he raised it to a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. Boy, this is a true repentance, huh? <laughs> he took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings, and thank offerings on and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, verse 17, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Well, here Manasseh is diligently seeking to right all of the wrongs and restore and rebuild that which he had destroyed. And to his credit, he even takes away these foreign gods, these sexual images, the idols, the altars that he had himself built, and he cast them out of Jerusalem. Wow, what a, what a conversion. What a, what a change of heart. Uh, this again is, I believe, uh, a picture of the magnificent grace of God in the life of one who's been forgiven of so much. This is how it is. When you are on that receiving end of such a magnificent grace and such a profound mercy from the hand of God, it propels you to respond in this way. F.B. Meyer said, turn to him with brokenness of soul and he will not only forgive but bring you out again and give you, as he did Manasseh, an opportunity of undoing some of those evil things which have marred your past. You know, after I got saved some 35 plus years ago now, I sought to go back and try to right some of the wrongs that I had, you know, uh, committed. <laughs> took me a long time. I was only 19 years of age, but boy, I had made a, a big mess of my life. And, but boy, my heart was so changed. I wanted to go back. And even back to uh, my high school where I was just 
such a wretch. You know, I just asked for forgiveness and apologized, tried to make it right with uh, many of the uh, teachers and uh, the principal even, who I had spent a lot of time in his office, <laughs> got to know him really well. I had reserve seating in the principal's office, but anyway, verse 18. Now, the rest of the acts of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Also, verse 19, his prayer. And how God received his entreaty and all his sin and trespass and the sites where he built high places and set up wooden images and carved images before he was humbled. Indeed, they are written among the sayings of Hosea, which we don't have. God didn't deem it necessary to include it in uh, the canon of inspired scripture. So Manasseh, verse 20 Plus, I don't want to know all of the, I mean, there's even more graphic detail. That's okay. I, I get it. Verse 20, so Manasseh rested with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. <sighs> Here we go. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years, 24 months. <laughs> but... He did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh has made, had made and served them. And here's the difference, though. Verse 23, he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. Is that even possible? <laughs> I mean, he, he sinned as his father had sinned. He didn't humble himself as his father had humbled himself. And as, as evil as his father was, as much as the sin, as evil as it was that his father committed, he committed more and more? you got to be pretty creative to do that. Then, verse 24, what a way to go. <laughs> his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. These were his own servants. But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. What? So in other words, <laughs> his servants conspire against him and kill him then the people of the land killed those who conspired against him and killed him. That's a lot of people getting killed. What, I mean, then, and this is how I want to end our Bible study tonight, thank God. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. Okay. So let me see if I got this straight. I mean, the study of the kings is, as you know, very fascinating. So you got Hezekiah, a good king, a godly man. He has an evil son, Manasseh. Manasseh has another son, Ammon, bad guy, evil man. And Ammon has a son, and his son is Josiah. You know who Josiah is, right? We met him in Kings. This was a great king. In fact, he is one of the best kings that Judah ever had. And so that's what we're going to, Lord willing, uh, pick it up with uh, next week. But I find it really interesting that the narrative takes this abrupt turn. It's almost like the chroniclers, like, they, they killed them, they killed him, they conspired against him, they conspired against him, they killed him, everybody's dying, everybody's evil, it's just horrible. But Josiah now reigns in his place. It's like there's hope now. And you can put all that aside and God in his grace and his mercy, mercy brings this son, Josiah, and uh, he reigns in uh, a good king, one of the uh, nine good kings, King Josiah. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. 
Father in heaven, thank you so much. Even though it's kind of gnarly and a little bit tough, kind of a hard study to see just how horrible these men were, the, the, the deeds that they did, the, the practices that they practiced. And Lord, I just, I thank you that there's hope here, that there's a, a Josiah at the end of this, that there's repentance at the end of Manasseh's life. It gives us hope, Lord, and for that we're very grateful. Again, Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.